What's going on everybody? I have a new video for you. I also have a new set for you. How do you like it? I've been working on it for a little bit and uh, yeah. Hope you guys have been good. I have not been posting a lot. I was doing a ton of editing. Um, I think I have, let's see, I have 12 throwback episodes done and I've got eight episodes of season two done. And I think I'm expecting to have probably 12 or 13 total episodes of season two. So I'm getting a lot of the a lot of the bulk editing content finished up, queued up on YouTube's, and uh, so I can start doing other more enjoyable things like gear reviews, saddle hunting videos, stuff like that. That usually takes up my time during the summer. So uh, lots of stuff coming at you. Not tons of kills in season two. Um, there are some some kills, but uh, I think more than anything, there's a lot of learning experiences. Uh, I was also trying to help get my brother David on a deer a lot. So a lot of my hunts were with him, um, but unfortunately, just didn't get a lot of kills down. But we were making up for that big time though for with the throwback videos because um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cool stuff coming at you with that, and uh, I put a lot of time into those throwback videos, so I think they're gonna be pretty cool. Uh, anyways, <coughs> gosh, if I sound, uh, short on breath, it's because I am, uh, I just got, uh, over, well, still currently getting over COVID. I had it for like a week. Um, when I first got it, it was kind of more of just like a sinuses thing. And I, I was like, oh, I got Omicron, you know, it's really not that big of a deal I, I'll get over it real fast, you know, yada, yada. And then it just kind of got worse and worse. And uh, the nasal uh, sinus thing kind of um, turned into like a whole head cold thing. Um, I started getting like migraine headaches and then I started getting chills and I was started getting fevers. And um, and then eventually the, the sinus pain subsided, but the fever, fevers did not. I pretty much had fevers every single day. And the only thing that would get rid of them was getting on ibuprofen. And luckily, my wife is a nurse, so she was trying to alternate me between ibuprofen and I think Tylenol is the other one you're supposed to alternate, uh, just so that you don't do any damage to your kidney or liver or whatever they do damage to. Um, and it turned out that like ibuprofen was literally the only thing that was taking and breaking my fevers. And so she was constantly, like, getting up in the middle of the night, checking on me, um, being an uh, awesome wife, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, you know, there was not a time where I had uh, a fever that she was like, ah, uh, you know, like, she was, I mean, she was, like, throwing freezing cold wet washcloths on my back and on my forehead and just, you know, get, like, breaking my fevers every single time I was having them, which I was grateful for for a while, <laughs> Well, when it was going on, I wasn't always feeling grateful. Like it felt like I was getting stabbed with a bunch of knives when she was putting wet, cold things on me. But um, she was actually able to find somebody that prescribed um, iver ivermectin to me, which is a, a common drug that has been been being used to cure COVID around in different places. And um, unfortunately, for reasons I'm not very sure of and don't really understand. Um, it's not being administered um, very much in the U.S., and uh, the government kind of is looking looks down on it. Uh, a lot of the doctors won't aren't allowed to prescribe it or won't prescribe it. Um, but regardless what your opinion is on it or what the government's opinion is on it, I took it and I felt better almost immediately. And I am three days out from when I first started taking ivermectin, and I am almost 100% right now. Um, I'm still a little bit short on breath, um, just tired, really, honestly. I'm exhausted. When you have fevers every single day, you have fevers every night, like it just wears on you like a ton. So I'm getting over it. Luckily, I never, like I, it never got to the point where I had to go to the hospital or anything like that. My wife kept up on me pretty good. And on top of that, my mom's like a major health nut, um, uh, not in a bad way, but like, <laughs> very health conscious and uh, knows a ton about supplements and uh, different things that could help me. So she had me on a bunch of stuff too. But thankfully I'm on the upswing. Uh, that's been good. 
I know a lot of other people that have not been as fortunate as me that have had to go to the hospital. My buddy Mike Kenyon had it for two weeks. My buddy Adam had it for two weeks. Um, a lot longer than me. I'm I'm going on, it's like a week, I think. Yesterday was a week from when I first got it. But yeah, if you've never heard of I- ivermectin, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. But I did talk to a doctor and she said it was a really good drug. So uh, yeah, that's my story. And uh, now I got to kind of get back on the ball and start doing work again, start editing, um, start helping flip houses, do the whole nine yards, jump back into the flow of things again. If I recorded this um, podcast, I don't know if I'd call it a podcast. This is really not a podcast. <laughs> I really don't want to have to upload another thing on a regular basis, but a vodcast, a video cast, whatever it is. I've already done it once, and uh, my recording kind of abruptly ended um, right in the middle. So I'm going to try to keep an eye on my camera and not have that happen again. But today's video is going to be on things that you can do during the winter time to make you a better hunter um, or just enjoyable things to do in general. And I got like three or four things um, that I think are a, a good for me, it doesn't matter anymore. My deer season's over. But for you, you might be in Ohio and, and have a deer season that runs into February. But I don't have that luxury. So a lot of these uh, deer tactics, wintertime tactics, um, are more for those people, not me. So this is more retrospect for me. But I'll go through some of those stuff and then some other stuff that I like to do once deer season's over during the wintertime. Uh, before all the snow melts and we get into the typical scouting season and turkey season because that's really what everybody loves to be honest I mean at least for me I don't like the snow I'm ready for it to go as soon as it gets here and get on with springtime so during the winter and uh, if you have a deer season that runs into part of the winter or you get snow during part of your deer season that doesn't always apply to me I'd say on an average year I might get one decent snowfall during deer season maybe two on a really cold year but there's many years that i've had and i've had zero like noticeable snowfall um during deer season so uh you gotta take take this with a grain of salt based off of where you're at um but uh there are some cool tactics in here that i want to talk about so the first thing is pretty obvious but essentially just that snow on the ground gives you the ability to see longer distances and thicker cover so there's a, probably some spots that you can think of off the top of your head where you're like man i would it would be really helpful to be able to get up in a, a tree somewhere while, when there's snow on the ground in some of these spots because i bet you i could see a long way i bet you i could see deer moving and sometimes that's all you need to be able to get a better read on the area i can tell you right away there's some cattail swamps where you know, forget it when it comes to trying to see into those things. But if you got snow on the ground and you can get up a tree on the, on the edge of them, you can see down into them and you'll be able to spot deer in them. But it's, it's only when you have snow. So when you do get snow, all like some of those spots can be like money. And on top of that, you know, you can go and you can walk some semi thick timber. If you've got some, some timber with some rolling hills it's really thick, and normally, you know, you're bumping into deer left and right and spooking them around. Well, when you get snow on the ground, you can just go peek over top of hills and stuff, and you can spot deer way, way easier and um, be able to do uh, a lot more effective still hunting. And snow just can give you that opportunity to get out there and make something happen that before you might not have been able to make happen. Secondly, snow can give you some excellent information when it comes to reading a track. And this is its own thing like there's been entire books written about this my brother gave me one for christmas called um like big bucks the Benio bennett way Benio way i'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it but uh, it's about these this family of trackers from vermont and this is pretty much all they do like this is their number one strategy of killing deer is by tracking them and of course they have you know, more days with good snow up there. So it's something that can be done on a year by year and year out basis. But there is a lot that you can learn by reading tracks, by following tracks. Um, if you ever do get a fresh snowfall that, you know, that happens at night and you got, you know, a couple hours, you know, two, three hours and then daylight and you can, and you can find 
a big track and get on it, like follow that thing, like, like see what you can learn from it. Like there's so many things that, that have been taught about tracking deer that you can learn. Either you can learn it, but you know, for yourself through experience, there's books like this one, that one I just mentioned to you, um, that you can read, but just by, by seeing what the deer's doing, um, you know, if the tracks go through a couple of narrow trees, you can tell how big the deer's rack is. Um, you know, if you have the tracks, they start, they start feeding. Typically that's right before a deer will bed, it'll start to feed. So, you know, Hey, I better slow down big time here because this deer might not be that far away. There's all sorts of stuff that you can learn about tracking deer. And to be honest, I wouldn't mind going up North someday and just trying to do it because, <laughs> cause it sounds fun. <laughs> Got to keep checking on my camera, but, um, <clears throat> Number three is just understanding snowfall and how um, different snow conditions affect deer movement. And I'm not talking about tracking deer and stuff like that. I'm talking about when you're going in traditional, like traditionally hunting deer, whether that's still hunting for deer or you're going in and setting up on them. Um, knowing the condition of the snow and how that's going to affect the deer and how that will change based off of weather, all that is really important. So for instance, um, you get a nice fresh layer of snow on the ground. It's fluffy. Of course, the deer are going to move. It's not really going to affect them whatsoever. Um, if anything, it's a really good thing to have a nice fresh layer of snow on the ground. But if you have a layer of snow on the ground and then the sun comes out that afternoon, and melt a little bit of it, and then that freezes at night, you can guarantee yourself that come morning, if you go in there, you're going to sound like an elephant walking across, you know, a room full of Legos, and by the time you get to your spot that you want to set up on, you've probably blown everything out of there. And with really crunchy snow, there's high possibility that if the, you know, the deer might be moving a little bit, they also might be bedding. You know, there's a lot of times when the conditions are quiet, the snow is crunchy, um, or if it's leaves crunchy, the deer just bed down. They just, they just bed until either something happens, like the birds start singing, the wind picks up a little bit, the sun comes out and melts some of the, the crust off of the ground of the snow. Um, something has to happen to push them to move and so because they feel comfortable you know I always think of deer as being like little self-conscious creatures where they're like they just can't they're not going to be that one little guy making all this noise and knowing everybody can hear them like they won't do that they have to feel safe they have to feel like they can hear what's going on but then predators can't hear them walking around very well so always keep that in mind when you're um, just checking the weather and the conditions before you go out and set up on deer in the winter. And then number four, uh, super obvious, but super important, deer drives. Deer drives in the winter are usually way more effective than just deer drives normally because you can see better. I mean, there's a lot of times where deer can skirt past you and unless there's snow, if there is snow, you can see them. But there's so many times I I can't tell you how many times I've tried to do deer drives and I know a deer skirted past me and I just couldn't quite tell what it was. I couldn't quite tell where it went. It's just deer blend in very well. So when you have a nice layer of snow on the ground and your standards are up in elevated spots, like you can really see what's going on a whole lot better when there's snow on the ground. I can tell you of, of you know, multiple different stories of fun deer drive experiences that we've had. You know, one time my brother uh, was up in a stand and we pushed a group of three does to him and he literally dropped each of them in their tracks just one after another, just boom, boom, boom. And they just stood there <laughs> and that was really crazy. Um, never seen that happen before. And then, you know, I think we've shot, you know, a couple, two different times. I think we've probably taken some deer on snow deer drives and it's just it's a lot of fun oh i just got a picture of a buck my one trail camera that's still working he's not a big big deer but he was uh he's a public land deer nice little eight point he'll probably be pretty good next year so that's what i've got when it comes to deer hunting uh winter tips but here deer season's over so one of the things that i love to do uh, once deer season over is I, I, I pack up all the deer stuff, 
put it away and I get out the small game stuff and um, I polish off my squirrel rifles and um, it's not just for me but more so to be able to get um, some of the younger people out into the woods. I know for instance this year my little brother Matthew has been bugging me so much during the during deer season of hey let's go squirrel hunting hey let's go squirrel hunting and it's never really worked out so, super well because um, the spot that would be the easiest to take him also is one of our best deer hunting spots so it's you know I don't really want to go take him and blow the woods up um, when I'm going to go try and kill you know 140 inch buck that I've been seeing back there so a lot of times once deer season's over I get back there I pick out my I get my squirrel guns and I go take uh, take them out and this year we did that just that pretty much um it was on a frigid day um absolutely freezing i think it was it was in the teens um the temperature was and the wind chill was below zero for sure and uh i went out there shot my gun uh, a little bit and uh, it was so freezing cold that my clip was jamming every single time i wanted to reload so i had to shoot and i had to eject my shell and then I had to take my clip out of my gun, unjam the bullet from inside the clip so that it would stick out, but to put the clip back in and load my new bullet. So it was a crazy process just to load a second shell into my gun. Um, my fingers were getting like numb and felt like frostbite by the time I was done just, sh just shooting my gun to make sure it was on. Um, and so then we ended up... Uh, going out there and trying to plank some squirrels. We didn't have a ton of action. Um, and the whole time that we were, I had math and then David went out by himself um, to, to his spot that he wanted to go to. So we're on one side of the woods, he's on the other. And while we're trying to find squirrels, we, all we can hear on the other side of this wood lot is pew, pew, pew. <laughs> And he's just knocking them out, evidently. I don't know if he was or not, but he was shooting a lot. And so uh, Matthew is kind of getting a little bit annoyed. And he, so he kept saying, like, let's go over there. Let's go over there. And I was like, yeah, there's squirrels everywhere, you know, buddy. Like, just because we go over there doesn't mean we're going to kill them. Anyways, we found one den tree, and then there was a couple of squirrels. And he, he, he had spotted one of them um, moving around up there. So we went over there to go stake that out. Well, we, by the time we walked up to it, of course, the squirrels weren't moving around up in there. So I decided to go walk up to that tree and just look up there, see if I could see anything. Sure enough, I saw that squirrel on the back side of that limb trying to play the whole ring around the rosy game. So I said, hey, you stay right here. I'm going to get on the other side of the tree and, you know, get set up and everything. Get your gun up there, and I'm going to move around the tree on him, and then he'll come around your side, and you can shoot him. So we did it, and he came around his side, and he shot him, and the squirrel dropped to the ground, and then got right back up on the tree. <laughs> and of course, he's like, I got to shoot again. I got to shoot again. And so I was, you know, trying to load my stupid gun that's, you know, jamming because it's so freezing cold and probably because it's a horrible, you know, a horrible uh, design of the clip on top of that. But by the time I get a second bullet in, the squirrel is up the tree. Um, and I think he found a hole or something like that. So math was pretty, uh, pretty bummed about that. And uh, by the time we were getting ready to move to our next spot, David had hunted out his whole stretch, and he came up and he had like three squirrels. So um, it was it was fun. Um, it was fun to see him goofing around and uh, kind of they were like hanging their squirrels on the, on the trees and trying to make them look real and just you know playing around being boys. But uh, I think uh, yeah, squirrel hunting is just. Uh, a really fun thing that that we can do in the winter time. I know there's even like an actual squirrel hunting tournament that goes on um, down by my place a little bit, just south of me. And so, in years past, me and my buddy Scott have actually signed up for this. And like you, you I mean, like it goes by weight. So you like you ch you can kill your limit of squirrels, and then you go and you weigh them, you weigh them in, and the person that has the most weight wins. And there's like all these different prizes and stuff like that, but it's just a, an absolute blast. Like it gives you a reason to get out into the woods, and you know, just get your your little sniper guns out and uh, have a lot of fun. But <coughs> I think I overdid it. <coughs> I think I overdid it when I went out in the 
when I was squirreling with my brothers this last time because of just how freaking cold it was. And I didn't think a whole lot about it, but looking back, I think I, I would have waited for a uh, more fair weather day because it was just so frigid. We hunted about most in the morning, and then they all went back home, and I stayed out there, and I went and I pulled two trail cameras walking about a mile because I had my I got my gun, I got my shooting sticks, I got my backpack, and I got this bottle of water. And I had the water out there with me because I got a jet boil and all sorts of stuff in my pack. So I was wanting water so I could, you know, use it, which I never did. <laughs> so anyways, I go out and I grab my trail cams. I throw them in my back, in my, in my pack. And then I'm coming back and I, I totally, it just totally slipped my mind that I have a pop-up blind out there on the corner of the field. And of course it had snow all caving in on it and everything. So I decided, hey, I'll go ahead and grab that too. So I pull that down and then I just take my rifle and my shooting sticks and I lay them inside the pop-up blind and I grab it all with two hands. I got my water bottle on, you know, on one hand, hold my pop-up blind, my rifle, my shooting sticks and my backpack on my back. And I walk all the way back to where my brother's going to pick me up in the truck. And let me tell you what, I destroyed myself. Like, like just breathing in that cold air and exerting that much energy. Um, like I just, I just totally was exhausted. And that was on Saturday, Sunday. Um, I just pretty much rested all day. Monday, I didn't go to work cause I did kind of felt a little bit icky. Tuesday, I felt fine. And then Wednesday, I just got hammered, and I was just out from Wednesday till today is Friday of the next week. So, yeah, be very careful when you're out in the wintertime doing wintertime stuff. Uh, don't let it destroy your immune system or put you in a uh, place where you could get sick easy, because <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> the only other thing that I really have done in the wintertime that you can only do in the wintertime would be uh, drone scouting. So this one is one that you'll have to kind of, uh, take with a grain of salt, uh, take at your own discretion, um, look at your own state regulations. Um, so essentially what I do is I use my drone to fly over different pieces of public land and, um, just gather intel on them. So, um, it's kind of like getting your own, uh, personalized, aerial videos and imagery it's super cool it's it gives you tons of intel very quickly um i can usually i can i can tell stuff that i would never be able to see from you know onyx or tobo right away and uh, give me just a little bit better edge of where i should start looking when i get boots on the ground during the uh during the spring but it's real easy to look and find um cover break lines. You can usually tell, you know, what's softwoods, what's hardwoods really fast. Um, and you can also just find deer. Like when you do have snow on the ground, deer stick out like really well. And, and granted it's the winter time, it's late winter. So deer are yarded up. They're in uh, areas close to food. Does are in very large groups. So, you know, it's not the information that you get isn't always going to be accurate to the hunting season because it's not hunting season but um, still a lot of times I found that when you do you know find does that um, they're usually in known bedding areas so you can usually go back and you'll find sign in those areas or you can see like maybe it maybe those were bedding areas that the deer might use during season maybe they're not you know but they might be again I would just check with your regulations on it um, I know here in Michigan the only um, regulations that I've been able to find when it comes to uh, drones in relation with hunting, is you can't use a drone in any way to aid yourself in hunt the act of hunting. So um, I don't ever fly a drone in the air during hunting season. Like you will not like I'm like I might try to, I might fly it near some land if I'm just trying to get some cool shots or something to splice into a story. But like I'm not going and flying over any kind of state land or nothing like that during the season. I do it well after season's over, well after nobody's in the woods for any reason, really. And um, I also do a thorough check, and I make sure nobody's actually in, in the woods at all. Like, no trucks parked, nothing. Because I don't want to, even if somebody's, like, squirrel hunting, I don't want to ever interfere with anybody's hunting because that would be hunting, hunter harassment. 
And then you're on a whole, you know, new level of regulations you don't want to get into. So I'm merely trying to fly over for, you know, recreational viewing purposes alone. I'm just, you know, looking and seeing what's out there. Um, just, you know, and then g- gathering whatever, you know, intel that I see um, by viewing those videos and, and photos that I took. So, um, so that's something that I've done. Uh, if it becomes a, a popular thing, <laughs> they might end up putting regulations on it. I don't know. I've never seen anybody else doing it before, but it's something I enjoy doing. Uh, be careful, though, because um, if you fly your drone on a day that's too cold or that had the dew point's too high, uh, what can happen is that you can get condensation that will develop on the wiring on the inside of your drone. And then if you get it above a certain level, the temperature can change drastically. So like it could be like 30 degrees down, you know, by you and then be like way freaking colder once you get up higher. And so you got to be real careful when you start getting real high in the air. Um, cause I've ruined a drone before and had to go, had to ship down and get fixed and all that stuff because, um, pretty much I froze some wires that snapped and it it was part of the gimbal system. So I was just flying my drone. And then all of a sudden, uh, I just started seeing like my image just started vibrating like crazy and my, my gimbal, something happened to my gimbal and, uh, just totally fried it. So be careful about that. That's pretty much all I got, uh, for this episode. Um, yeah, hopefully I wasn't too boring. I don't have anybody here with me. Uh, I think maybe on the second one that I'm doing, I might have my wife actually joining me because uh, I want to do a kind of a topic uh, when it comes to uh, hunting and uh, marriage slash dating relationships with women <laughs> because it's a very uh, touchy subject, especially for women. Uh, for guys, we're just like, what's the big deal? You know, like I just, just going hunting, <laughs> you know? And, uh, so I know it really depends on, you know, who you're married to or who you're dating and what they think is okay or not okay. But, um, I know I've been able to get away <laughs> with a lot, uh, this year. I, I went on two different trips, I hunted a lot, but, um, you know, it just, I have a great relationship with my wife. We've developed a good understanding and there's different things that I've been able to do. I feel like that help our communication, um, when it comes to her understanding of my passion for hunting and me communicating that I care about her and her passions too. And trying to have that be mutually, um, beneficial. Um, it's just something that I think uh, deserves more, uh, discussion than there has been at least in the past. So uh, we're going to be going uh, on our own vacation, actually, just us down to Tennessee um, towards the end of February. So I'm sure that we're going to be probably recording it in our little cabin that we've got down there reserved for us. And uh, we'll be bringing that to you guys once we get it recorded. But anyways, um, that is all I got for you right now. Uh, When springtime comes, we're going to I know for a fact that there'll be nonstop content from then to through till through the end of fall. <clears throat> Sorry, I can't talk. <sighs> but for right now, you'll have to be happy with uh, the spread of content that I'm able to get out. But <clears throat> thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Enjoy winter. Spring's coming. It's almost there. It's almost here. You can do it. Just hold on. Just keep looking at the new equipment that's coming out. YouTube some more ATA videos, guys. Of course, if you don't live in Michigan, you're probably like, that's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But here in Michigan, it's like Battleship Gray Day every day. And it sucks. I'm tired of it. But that's all I got. Catch you later.